worship by speaking into our presence those who aren't with us beginning today as always with our beloved sister congregation that meets in La Vaita, Cuba with Pastor Sila and her congregation what a joy and a privilege it is to worship with them across the miles and um, through the conduit of the Holy Spirit we gather with them today. They also have communion on the first Sunday of the month, and it just delights me to think of us having communion with them when we, when we enjoy the Lord's Supper. So um, welcome to our brothers and sisters in Cuba and around the world, and also to those who are normally here but couldn't make it today. I talked with Eddie and Ann this morning, and they assure me they will be here next week. Okay. I wouldn't mind if everybody just reminded them of that. Um, they might mind, but, but I, I wouldn't. Um, so uh, anyway, they are, have, they've been moving uh, Ann's mother into an assisted living facility, and it has taken a real toll on them in a lot of ways. And so they do hope to be with us next week. Also, I spoke with Litzy and Lupe this morning. I believe both of them are working today. So they are not with us today for that reason. Other people who are not with us today. David, we speak David into our presence with lots of love and, and hope for healing. Others. We would speak Craig into our existence, and to our presence, not into existence, because it would be too late for that. Already done. Uh, but he, he is here. He has just stepped out of the room. Craig is here. Yeah. Jennifer and the boys, we speak them into our presence. We enjoyed having the whole Tachinko family here last week. And Kim Dotson, I believe, is with us online, but thank you, Jeff. Who else is with us online today? Robin Parker. Welcome, Robin. Welcome, Trellis. Are there others? Then let us worship God together as we sing our first hymn, which is? We're going to do two to start with for All right. fun. Wonderful. The, uh, Gabrielle and, because uh, I missed out on Ocomo Come Emmanuel. Oh, that's right. They, they wanted to sing with us. So we're going to do Angels We Have Heard on High, number seven. And then, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, followed right up after it. Wonderful. So feel free to stay in church at seven.
Emmanuel number 42. We are on the second Sunday of Advent, and this Advent at Ecclesia, we are celebrating different kinds of families. And so today, we have asked Gabby and her dad, and also Jeff, but today it's going to be Gabby and Adam instead, um, to light our two Advent are two of our purple advent calendars and if y'all candles sorry if y'all will stand on this side that would help everybody to see you it, it i think your dad can light it as you're reading yeah <laughs> it's it's on there somewhere Make a level highway in the wilderness for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain and hill will be flattened. Uneven ground will become level and rough terrain a valley plain. The Lord's glory will appear and all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. 
Thank you, God, for giving us peace in times of division. Help the Ecclesia family to shine the light of peace around the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gabby and Adam. We appreciate your service in all of the ways that you bless our church and the way your family blesses our church. We come now to our time of prayers of the people. And in this week of peace, when we celebrate Advent peace, we have once again been riveted to news of school shootings and terror in our world. Not just that, but also devastating medical news for members of our church family. For, for Chris and Jermaine, the, their road has come to an end and far, as far as being biologically related, <laughs> but that's okay because their hearts are entwined and they will continue to work for a cure for Jermaine as they seek another donor um, for Jermaine who has kidney disease and is looking for a kidney donor. Um, we, we grieve today with Chris um, and with Jermaine over this devastating news that took them eight months, uh, eight months to receive. Um, a lot of questions, a lot of frustrations about why it took so long to get the no, a lot of, um, a lot of emotions to deal with. And so um, if, if we're feeling a little bit of turmoil in this Sunday of peace, there's a lot of reasons why. We also, as everyone knows, suffered another school shooting this week. That is a, a valley and, and a rough place in our nation that we must address in whatever way you can. There is no one who wants children to be shot in schools. That person doesn't exist. So I don't know where you are. I don't think it's controversial at all. I don't care where you are on the spectrum. Nobody wants this to happen. And so wherever you fall on that, whatever you can do, um, you're probably feeling some turmoil within you today over that issue. And so um, we come into this place with all kinds of things, troubling our minds and troubling our spirits. And that doesn't even include all the personal things, the sick family members, the frustrations at school and work, addiction, illness, goals that we've set for ourselves and find ourselves nearing the end of the year without having achieved those goals once again. And so now in, in some crazy um, way, we're asked to be peaceful. That seems a little bit uh, naive, doesn't it? To be in the midst of crazy and to feel peaceful. And yet that is how we're called to be different. We are called to be peaceful. That doesn't mean we're called to be quiet. That doesn't mean we're called to ignore or called to push aside. But it does mean that we are called to dig into the peace that surpasses all understanding. And so it's with our hope of that peace that we go to God now in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you've promised us at Advent that hope and peace and joy and love are ours for the taking. And yet we feel within our spirits a tug towards despair hopelessness toward chaos, toward overwhelming sadness, and to hating those who are different from us, 
Oh God, the temptation is so strong to lean into the opposite of what you would have us to do, to be, to become. We confess we don't always do a great job resisting that temptation. We confess that it really feels a lot easier to hate than to love. To be negative and focus on all the wrong things rather than celebrate life's joys. It's just, it's just so much easier to stir up and enjoy chaos rather than serve as instruments of peace. And oh God, when we look at the headlines, despair creeps in around our hearts and our minds, and we look out to our families and our loved ones and our jobs and our schools, and despair comes closer, and yet you call us to hope. Release us, O oh God, from that temptation. Turn our hearts to you in this hour. Let it be not about what we need, what we want, what we are tempted to do. Let it be about your kingdom and your kingdom coming right now, today, on earth as it is in heaven. And so, God, with confidence, we lift up those names of those who are suffering illness or other issues that are heavy on our hearts this morning. And we ask, oh, God, Lord, in your infinite mercy, hear our prayer. David. Jermaine. Danny Hardy. Lord, in your mercy. And now let us pray as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for our second hymn. Please stand as we sing. O Little Town of Bethlehem. O Little Town of Bethlehem. I think it's 47. Okay. I didn't write it down. Number 47 or thereabouts. <laughs> Just say it with confidence.
Trying to find the best place to hear and to see. Because it's time for the children's story. Woohoo! And today's book is it's one of my favorites. It really is, though. It really, really is this time. It's called Mean Jean. The Recess Queen. I have read it before, but I want to read it again. I used to read this every year at my kid's school. So at least one of my children is on, and she probably remembers this one. It's called The Recess Queen, and it is by Alexis O'Neill. These very fun and exciting pictures were drawn by Laura Somebody, Laura, whose last name I can't pronounce. It begins with an H and a B, H dash B. <sighs> Gotta take a deep breath for this one. Mean Jean was a recess queen and nobody said any different. Nobody swung until Mean Jean swung. Nobody kicked until Mean Jean kicked. Nobody bounced until Mean Jean bounced. If kids ever crossed her, she'd push them and smoosh them and lollapaloosh them, hammer them, slammer them, kits and kajammer them. Say what? Mean Jean Drought. Say who? Mean Jean Howard. Say you. Just who do you think you're talking to? Mean Jean always got her way. Until one day. A new kid came to Sue, school, Katie Sue, a teeny kid, a tiny kid, a kid you might scare with a jump and a boop. But when the recess bell went ringity ring, this kid ran zingity zing for the playground gate. Katie Sue swung before Mean Jean swung. Katie Sue kicked before Mean Jean kicked. Katie Sue bounced before Mean Jean bounced. The kid you might scare with a jump and a boo was too queen, new, too new to know about Mean Jean, the recess queen. Well, Mean Jean bullied through the playground crowd. Like always, she pushed kids and smushed them, lot of pollution kids, hammered them, slammed them, and kids and kajammered them as she charged after that Katie Sue. Say what? She growled, say who? She howled, say you. She snarled and grabbed Katie Sue by the collar. Nobody swings until Queen Jean swings. Nobody kicks until Queen Jean kicks. Nobody bounces until Queen Jean bounces. And she figured that would set the record straight. She figured wrong. Katie Sue talked back. Just as sassy as she could be, she said, how did you get so bossy? Then that puny thing, that loony thing grabbed the ball and bounced away. Oh, Katie Sue was one quick kid. She bolted quick as lightning. Bouncity, bouncity, bounce, kickity, kickity, kick, swingity, swingity, swing. Mean Jean thundered close behind. Bouncity, kickity, swingity, the ring recess queen was not amused. She raced and chased and in your face that Katie Sue. No one spoke. 
No one moved. No one breathed. Then, from her pack, pulled Katie Sue a jump rope, clean and bright. Hey, Jeannie Beanie, sang Katie Sue. Let's try this jump rope out. Here's one thing true. Until that day, no one dared ask me and Jean to play. But that Katie Sue just hopped and jumped and skipped away. I like ice cream, I like tea, I want Jean to jump with me. Jean just gaped and stared as if too scared to move at all. So Katie Sue sang once more. I like popcorn, I like tea, I want Jean to jump with me. Then from a side, a kid called out, go Jean, go. And too surprised to even shout, Jean jumped in with Katie Sue. I like cookies, I like tea, I want you to jump with me. The rope whizzed and slapped faster, faster the rope spun and flapped faster, faster till it caught in a tangled disaster, but they just giggled and jumped again. Well, now when recess rolls around, that playground's one great place. At the school bells ringity ring, those two girls race zingity zing out the classroom door. Jean doesn't push kids and smush kids, lollapalush kids, hammer them, slam them, and kits and kajammer them because she's having too much fun. Rompity romping with her friends. The end. Good. Isn't that so fun? I know, I love it. What the children at Mean Jean Schools, or as we now call her, just plain Jean, Jean found out was that sometimes it's hard to make peace where there's chaos. It's not easy, it's scary, and it, it makes you feel all vulnerable inside. But boy, <laughs> it sure is worth it. Because on the playground, after they became friends, they had peace. And that meant they could play together. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for teaching us how to play together, even when we don't really want to. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our gospel lesson today comes from the book of Luke. If you're able, we invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel out of respect for the words of Jesus Christ. Today we'll be in the third chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 6. Hear the word of the Lord. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias ruler of Abilene during the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and amen. Okay, raise your hand if you love road construction. Anybody? 
on my road. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, Karen is the exception because Karen has a whole lot of rough places oh, that need awesome. to be made plain in her on her road. I remember when we moved to Asheville 24 years ago, there were murmurings back then of widening Highway 74, which went through the Reynolds area and Fairview. When we actually moved in, there was talk of, of little else. My kids remember the orange highway pylons as nostalgic images of their childhood. <laughs> I remember conversations revolving around those pylons as we were sitting in long lines of traffic stalled by the con construction. I'd ask the kids, so if you have 10 orange pylons and you move them like say six inches to join 12 more orange pylons, how long do you think we're going to sit in this traffic? Or I would say, uh, kids, let's talk about where y'all want to go to college. I'm pretty sure once we get through all these orange pylons, y'all going to be high school graduates. I even told the children, y'all uh, y'all start planning your wedding with kind of an orange color scheme because <laughs> uh, we probably still going to be sitting in this traffic here time y'all find you beloved. At which point there was a long conversation about how they were going to find their beloveds in the car, which meant they missed the entire point. But they did learn a lesson of sarcasm there. In the car that day, road struck construction is so frustrating. And it takes forever, right? And yet, when that work on 74 was complete, and all four lanes were open, oh, it was worth it. I remember one of my friends say, it was, she lived in Fairview and she worked in Hall Creek. And so she had to go through that construction every day to get to work. And she said one day, um, I just have to be really careful because it's so freeing now. I, I, I fly down the highway and I'm afraid I'm gonna get a ticket because I can go so fast down the highway now. Yeah. After going 25, going 45 felt like real freedom. Of course, I think she may have been going a little faster than that because there was no traffic. It was just, comparatively speaking, absolute peace on that highway after the valley had been filled in and the mountain had been brought low and the rough places were made plain. We could go today as we continue our advent journey in luke um last week we started advent at towards the end of the gospel of luke today we've moved back towards the beginning not all the way but close to the beginning to chapter three now jesus is not yet in the manger ready for christmas his birthday festivities. Jesus is still all grown up in today's text, or at least we assume Jesus is, because his cousin, John, who was born about the same time, is all grown up. You see, Jesus and John were cousins. Jesus's mother, Mary, was related to a woman named Elizabeth, who was married to Zechariah. Elizabeth had never had children, wanted them desperately, and by a miracle, she was granted a baby, a boy. And so the story goes, the scriptures tell us that when Mary visited her relative, either a cousin or a sister, um, not sure, when she went to visit her John, a few months older, a few months farther along the line, in, in utero mm -hmm. leapt at the presence of the messiah who was a whole uterus maybe away. two away <laughs> john was so already drawn to the messiah that even as a, a pre-born child he was delighted by the presence of jesus but today's scripture tells us that that baby of Elizabeth, that miracle child, has, is all grown up and has uh, begun his ministry in the wilderness. 
of all places. Luke, as Luke does, begins the text today with some historical facts. He begins by telling us about Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar was the emperor of Rome who was in charge at the time. Now, that may ring familiar, but not quite, as you recall the story of Jesus' um, birth when Augustus Caesar called for all the world to be taxed or counted. Tiberius came after Augustus. Remember, we haven't gotten Jesus back to the manger yet. So Tiberius was later. He was after Augustus. And so Tiberius is the, the ruler of the known world for them, the biggest guy, the world leader. And then Luke kind of talks it back and gets all the way right there to this little known leader, Lysanias, who's over there in Abilene, which all of us thought was in Texas, but turns out it's in the region of Palestine. It's like, we don't know why Luke gives us all of those details, but it's like if someone, at least in the South, were to recount something that happened um, a long time ago, this was written a good bit after it actually occurred, it, it, it would go something like this. So John the Baptist, you know, he was preaching back in, let's see, when was that? Um, well, I know Ananias and Caiaphas, they were the preachers down to the church. And uh, let's see, that guy Lysanias, that guy, he's over in Abilene. And who was it? Who was our governor? Well, Philip. Philip was here in Herod. That was when Tiberius was the president. That's when that, well, anyway, John was preaching back in there. And, and everybody who heard that had some understanding of what time it was, right? Just like if I said, you know, it's back when Jim Hunt was governor. Most of us in North Carolina immediately are in a different time and place. If you were raised in North Carolina, um, you, you go way back to a different time. And so, you, you hear things from that mindset, and that's what Luke is doing. He's taking us, readers, back to the time that John was preaching in the wilderness. He goes on to say, so anyway, John, you know, he was Zach's boy, Zechariah. Y'all know him. But he's preaching about changing your ways and offering to forgive sins and such and perform this kind of ritual dunking to prove it. I don't know what that was about, but that boy was always crazy. He was... You know, he was crazy like those Old Testament prophets, like Isaiah. All those other prophets who supposedly were making the way for the Messiah. But this guy, this guy was different. It's almost like he knew the Messiah. Uh, he just, he, he talked about those rough places that the, the prophets talked about, but he talked about them with a new hope and a new promise. He, he just told us that everything was going to be worked out, that all the bumps and bruises and crooks and crannies of our life would be resolved and we'd all be saved. That's what he said anyway. But the thing was, what John the Baptist would foretell, what he would announce was not an absence of violence, a kind of mindless, disconnected ignorance of the troubles of the world. That's not peace. That's withdrawal. Being mindless to the issues in the world and pretending that it's peaceful, that's not peace. That's just you, turn, you closing yourself off to the world. What John the Baptist was foretelling was shalom, the peace of God that is far more than just a lack of con uh, conflict. Shalom calls for action. It takes work. It calls for commitment. Well, it, it takes you into the wilderness. But boy, there sure is a lot of wilderness in there. And I, I don't want to go there. Do you? I don't want to feel like that. God, there's wilderness everywhere. There's a wilderness of, of gun violence, of addiction, of inequality. There's a, the wilderness of injustice, 
a lack of access to health care, mental illness, world hunger. There's wilderness everywhere. And, and if we want to make all the mountains low and the rough places smooth, we got to go to all of those rough places. And I don't want to. Do you? Do you want to go through all that? It's going to be hard. Really, really hard. And anyway, Jesus doesn't need us to, to clear the way to Jesus. Jesus can come to us any way we, he wants to come to us. It's us that have to move through the wilderness, move through the rough places to get where Jesus is. Because over and over again, scripture tells us that's where Jesus is. Jesus isn't in the temple. Jesus isn't with the rich and powerful. Jesus isn't with the emperors and the governors and the local rulers. Jesus is in the wilderness. Brian Stevenson, author of the amazing memoir, later made into a movie, Just Mercy. If you have, has, have y'all read the book, Just Mercy? It's a fabulous book. You should read it. I would recommend reading it. The movie's fine. Um, Michael B. Jordan stars in it, so there's reason enough to watch the movie. <laughs> Great movie, but um, the book is better. Much better. Much better, yeah. And it tells this story about Brian Stevenson's fight to um, help people who have been sentenced to die in prison. He's got a very famous TED Talk that uh, was one of the first TED Talks, I think, to go viral. And in this talk, he, he says this. When I was a young lawyer, I met Rosa Parks. He said, Rosa Parks used to come back to Montgomery every now and then, and, and she would get together with some of her dearest friends, Johnny Carr, the organizer of the Montgomery bus boycott, and um, Virginia Durr, whose husband, Clifford Durr, represented Dr. King. And these women would get together and they would just talk, and Brian Stevenson would go and he would sit there and listen to them talk. And every now and then, one of them would say, now, what? Uh, tell us again what you're up to. And he'd go over and he would tell, he would tell all of his plans, go over all the things that he was planning to do. And he'd say, um, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna work towards the equal justice and I've started this equal justice initiative and um, we're trying to challenge injustice and trying to help people who've been wrongly convicted. We're trying to confront bias and discrimination in the administration of criminal justice. We're trying to end life without parole sentences for children. We're trying to do something about the death penalty. We're trying to reduce the prison population. We're trying to end mass incarceration. And those old women sat there and he just said, woo wee, that's going to make you tired, tired, tired. <laughs> and then one of them leaned forward, Miss Carr, and she said, that's why you've got to be brave, brave, brave. Because making peace is hard work. You cannot do it without a sufficient amount of courage to face inequity in the world. Yet Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. As I was reading this week's text over and over again this week, I kept hearing the last part of the text in a cadence um, that, that I know, not from Luke, but from the 1960s March on Washington. When I hear those verses, I hear them in the cadence and intonation of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I hear them like this. <coughs> I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, <coughs> Every valley shall be engulfed, every hill shall be exalted, and every mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plains, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of our Lord 
shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I will go down to the south with. With this faith, we are able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of injustice of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to climb up for freedom, freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Too often we give up on freedom because it's too hard. We give up on that mountain of despair because it's too hard. I recalled with my daughter this week a time when I was in elementary school and I was standing waiting on the bus and one of my friends, this was in the 70s, I, I, I was probably eight. I think I was about eight, so like 72, 73, sometime in there. And uh, my best friend at the school was a boy named Venus. And if I could find that person, I would just, I would love to know whatever happened to Venus. I don't know his last name. Venus, I got picked on a lot when I was in elementary school. And Venus just took it upon himself to be my protector. And he was always right there with me to make chaos make peace out of chaos he's a lot taller than i was and just very you know very gregarious and well known and i was a little bit timid <laughs> i know it's been a long time ago um but he was always there supporting me venus was is i hope still alive uh black and i remember standing there waiting for the bus and it occurred to me in my eight-year-old mind I'm so glad that we get to go to the same school. I'm so glad I get to have Venus as my friend. And it was in that young child's mind that I realized that freedom for all is the same as freedom for one. And freedom for one is freedom from all, for all. And when we fight for those who don't have what we have, we bring about peace. And that is what we're called to do. That is what we're called to do. We are called to do the hard thing because we are on the winning team. We're on the side of Christ, the King of peace. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the power and the glory that is your holy name. Thank you for the privilege of being peacemakers in a, worn, torn, in a world torn by division. Help us, oh God, to do the hard things and to do them in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At Ecclesia, we practice open communion. We don't, uh, we don't check your ID. We don't check your history. We just welcome you to the table, the table set by Jesus Christ. Since Stan and Kim have been home from Cuba or visiting from their home in Cuba, however you want to look at it, um, Kim and I have been able to share this communion liturgy together, and I look forward to doing this again today. Next, next month, we'll do something different because they will be having communion with their brothers and sisters in Cuba, but today. But we'll be having it with you nonetheless. You'll be with us nonetheless. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and then he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Esto es mi cuerpo, que por ustedes es partido. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. After supper, 
Jesús tomó la copa y les dijo a sus discípulos, esta copa es la nueva alianza en mi sangre. This is my, this is the new covenant in my blood, the new covenant that is shed for forgiveness and joy. Drink it, all of you, in memory of me. Bendice, Señor, nuestro pan. Bless, O oh God, this bread. Give bread to those who are hungry. And hunger for justice for those who have bread. Bless, O oh God, this cup. Give it to those who are thirsty. And thirst for justice to those who have something to drink. Receive these gifts of God, for you are the people of God. Receive these gifts of God, for you are the children of God. Receive these gifts of God, for God loves each of you and all of you. Take and eat. For the bread we have eaten. For the cup we have received. For, for the, the life that we, we have been given. We, we give you, O oh God, our thanks and praise. Amen. 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 You have heard the word of God sung, proclaimed, lived out, and you have consumed the body of Christ. So we ask you now to respond in whatever way you feel led as we sing our final song, Angels, Angels We Have Heard on High. Number seven.
Before we close, we'll do a few 10 second announcements. The first one being, welcome back to Chris, who is on the guitar for the first time since his hand surgery. <laughs> Try not to hold on to any more crocodiles. And good. yeah, that's a good idea. Um, also, uh, meant to mention earlier that my sister's not with us today because she is out of town and wanted you all to know that she would miss being here with you, at least virtually. Um, forgot to mention that earlier. Do we have other 10 second announcements to share? There's a transformation village tonight. Transformation uh, village. And her brother Ben will be uh, serving dinner tonight. Wonderful. Dana and her brother Ben will be serving dinner at Transformation Village tonight. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, and I will be at Transformation Village on Wednesday. Of, oh, we got it. We got it. We got it Wednesday. We got it Wednesday. And then uh, yesterday we were um, at the VRQ serving breakfast. Uh, so thanks to all who participated in that. Are there other 10 second announcements? Okay, so top priority right now, Stan and Kim leave for Cuba in two weeks from tomorrow. And they will be um, taking medicines down there and are looking for particularly insulin for our sister pastor, Sila, who has diabetes and does not have access to insulin. So if your, past, if your doctor has samples or if you have samples that you haven't used, uh, then we would like to get those together and take those down. And any other medicines, if you are willing to donate those, do you also want medicine bottles? Well, I left our money in bottles because okay. the instructions and what they are is on that label. No, but I mean, do you want extra medicine bottles? Oh, I see. Empty medicine bottles. Uh, 